Christmas Crash Course. So now that we've gotten some introductory pieces out of the way, uh, we are ready to dig into how comics work. And to start that conversation, I'm going to begin by talking about visual rhetoric. In short, uh, visual rhetoric refers to the way that visual symbols create meaning. You see, if you're taking comic studies class or analyzing a comic, it's pretty likely that you're doing it in the context of an English class or a literature course. It's an almost natural pairing. We talk about reading comics, after all. But the emphasis on reading means that while the pictures play a part in interpretation, a lot of emphasis seems to be placed on interpreting narratives, characters, plot, etc. And the side effect is that the art sort of becomes secondary to those more literary elements. And that's why I want to start by emphasizing the power of visual rhetoric. I think we often take visual rhetoric for granted, in part because we live in such a deeply visual culture, one that is saturated with images and visual messages. So we just end up forgetting or overlooking how much of an impact visual messages have on our everyday lives. There are a lot of different ways to categorize the elements that make up visual rhetoric, but I prefer to break it down into seven elements. These are line, color, size, value, texture, composition, and content. No particular element of visual rhetoric is inherently more important than any other. They are interdependent. However, an artist might choose to focus on a particular element over another to achieve certain effects. And if an artist consistently focuses on particular elements of visual rhetoric in similar ways, we often identify that as an artist's style. So today, I'm going to talk about line. Art doesn't exist without line. A line appears whenever an artist puts a tool to paper and moves it, as opposed to, say, a dot. Lines can be thick or thin, rough or smooth, dark or light, solid or transparent, even, uneven, straight or curved, literal or implied. They can go in any direction. Lines are what create the shapes and outlines of the objects that we recognize. They create a sense of space and of perspective. Traditionally, horizontal lines are considered calming or restful because they mimic bodies lying down or parallel to the earth, things at rest. Vertical lines, however, are strong and imposing, and sometimes even spiritual, as the connection to the sky implies a connection to the heavens. Rectilinear lines, that is, things meeting at 90 degree angles, imply stability and stasis, like a well-built cabinet. Diagonal lines imply motion, movement, energy, while curved lines imply sensuality and humanity. Of course, in the hands of an individual artist, the traditional rules can always be broken. When you're looking at a piece of art, think about the nature of the lines, not just their shape or direction. Are they precise and evenly weighted? Are they scratchy and jumbled? Do they seem spontaneous and free-flowing? Think about the tools the artist used to make their lines. Are they using a brush or a pen? Something dry and scratchy or free-flowing and smooth. Think about why the artist might have chosen to use certain kinds of lines to create certain kinds of effects in the minds of their audience. Now, line is particularly important in comics. As I discussed a few weeks ago, comics have historically been associated with the clear, easy-to-read line style, in part because it has historically been a form of popular culture meant to be published and reproduced. So the whole purpose of the inker's job has been to make sure that the lines of the comics would be readable and reproducible. But this doesn't mean that comic artists have the same line style at all. In fact, line is often one of the quickest ways to identify a comic artist to define their style. I think, frankly, the easiest way to discuss some of these qualities of visual rhetoric rather than to put it into words is to show it. So let's look at the line quality of some comic artists. Here are a few close-ups of George Harriman's Crazy Cat. There's a bit of an improvisational sense to Harriman's lines. A little shake or shimmy, a little messiness. It makes the cartoon seem as though it's been quickly doodled on the page. We know they're not. For one thing, in the originals you can see traces of pencil. And for another, his page layout is so complex, both visually and narratively, that even a bona fide genius like Harriman would have to do some planning. But the line suits the world of the strip perfectly. The language of the strip often hits a similar tone. 
Herman created a particular patois for crazy, using puns, phonetic spelling, and a unique syntax that seems similarly slapdash on the surface, but ends up creating a strange kind of poetry. Likewise, the seeming simplicity and even amateurism of Harriman's line, its changing weight, its inability to stay straight, is actually a tightly controlled effect that aligns Coconino County and its residents with a seeming simplicity, with a childlikeness, and the fantasy of the setting works much better with all of those connotations. So Bill Sienkiewicz also has a messy line, but it's a much different beast than Harriman's. In this early New Mutants page, even the simplest lines, like outlines of a figure, are almost electric, jumping like a hot wire at every angle. The mutant warlock is a character that suits Sienkiewicz's style perfectly. The lines can stretch and change, but take a look at the grass and compare it to Harriman. This is interesting because the lines are pretty similar fundamentally. They're short vertical strokes depicting the same subject, grass, and yet the subtle details of how these lines are put to use make one look sort of like a kid's cartoon and another like an alien landscape. And here's another example. This time Sienkiewicz is inking Dan Jurgen's pencils on Day of Doom. He brings a fascinating dynamism and movement to this page, and part of that is through, well, motion lines. But look at the extra detail lines that he's adding to Superman's muscles, and the confusion that the messy lines in the background of the scenery add. It creates a kind of quivering movement to the whole page. So how about something a little more traditional? Take the clean, crisp illustration of Wally Wood. Wood's classic illustrative style fits with the classic sci-fi tone of this EC story, My World. His use of a brush pen means that there's a natural flow to the weight of the line, especially around curved lines, where you can see it's slightly thinner at some points and slightly thicker at others. others. This is even clearer on this page from Amazing Spider-Man number 121, which is penciled by Gil Kane and inked by John Romita Sr. So, so look at the way that the line width changes naturally in the hairlines and around Gwen Stacy's lips. Interestingly, Romita uses another characteristic of the same tool, the brush, to a different effect on the same page. Now, because a brush, unlike a pen, allows you to use different amounts of ink, you can have a smoothly flowing line or a rougher, raspier line. And he does this on the Green Goblin um, and the smoke following him. And that makes sense because the Green Goblin is the villain and so the drier, raspier lines make him seem unhinged and evil and raw, sort of scratching on the page as opposed to Gwen Stacy where the more full ink lines are beautiful and flowing and seem natural. So taking the clarity of line to extreme, there's actually a whole style based on clear lines, and it's called, well, clear line, or line claire if you're French. This was developed by Hergé, who's best known for his series Tintin. In this style, all of the lines are the same weight in the foreground, middle ground, and background, regardless of if the author is drawing a main figure or a background detail, something close or far away. And this creates a very, well, clear style. It's almost like a coloring book. On top of the clarity, it's very easy to read. It creates a sense of the world that everything belongs. So that even though Hergé draws Tintin quite cartoony, and the background's really detailed and quite realistic, because the line is the same throughout, the two different visual styles manage to fit together. Now, Lynn Claire has become uh, deeply associated with Bande Dessinées or Franco-Belgian comics, though there was a competing tradition during Hergé's time, often called the comic dynamic style seen here in Spirou. Hopefully by now, you can see the stark difference in the kinds of lines. One last example, Persepolis by Marjan Satrapi. Here she uses a thick, wobbly line, one that doesn't really allow for high levels of detail. She sticks to simple shapes, too, and the result of this line looks a bit, well, like a kid's drawing. And if you've read the memoir, you know that it's written in her voice and is the story of her as a child, so it makes sense that it looks like a child drew it.
The seeming simplicity of the line serves the story. It also looks a little bit like a woodcut, but that's a different thing. Anyway, that's a little bit on the magic of line. It's one of the most fundamental elements of visual rhetoric in any visual art, and definitely in comics. Next week, color. See you then. I hope you've been enjoying Comics Crash Course. If you'd like to help us out, I encourage you to click like, to tell your friends to check out our channel, and as always, to hit subscribe.